One of the most frequent questions I get from people who read governance and ministry is, how does it work in a congregation the size of mine? And that's a very good question because there's really nothing about a congregation that tells you as much about how it's different from other congregations as its size. The best measures of size, size for most congregations is either the average worship attendance, I actually use the median worship attendance throughout the year because that reduces the effect of extreme periods of, of uh, high or low attendance, or the number of households that contribute or that contribute significantly. I look at both of those numbers, especially as they change over time in a particular congregation, as the best way of telling how a congregation behaves. The, uh, there's a traditional set of size categories that was created a long time ago by Arlen Rothage and then developed mainly by the Auburn Institute over time that are family right. size, pastoral size, program size, and corporate size. I have trouble remembering because I don't actually use those exactly anymore. I still talk about family size, which is with an attendance number up to about 100. And pastoral size is a pretty good name for a group with attendance from about 100 to 250. And Instead of program size, which I think is a little confusing, I followed Susan Beaumont in calling the next category multi-celled size, that are about 250 to 400. And finally, uh, professional size runs about 400 to 800. Susan also has a couple of larger categories, strategic 800 to 1200, and matrix 1200 to 1800, and who knows, there are probably others. But nine-tenths of all North American congregations are actually uh, pastoral or family size. So most people listening to this recording will be in one of those or the others. About half of all congregations our family size, up to about a hundred. And the thing to know about a family size congregation is that what you say on paper or what you agree to explicitly about how the organization is going to behave explains only a tiny fraction of its decision-making behavior. Most of the fam family size decision-making has to do with the family leaders, the parents, the people who used to be called matriarchs and patriarchs, who are uh, the ones who are looked to because of their long, trustworthy leadership, that people have come to depend on them and to assume that nothing of importance will happen in the congregation without their blessing, typically without the unanimous blessing of all of the real parents. Oftentimes there will be a dozen uh, or, or fewer of uh, parents in a family size congregation. It is still useful, I think, to distinguish between governance and ministry, but it isn't enough for the people who happen to be on the official board at the moment to agree that that's useful or what the definition is or to adopt policies. What's actually important is for those parents to develop a habit of Sep having separate conversations about what to do versus the ones about carrying it out. And this is something a congregation of any size can do. A board, for example, of a small congregation, especially if it has several of the parents on it, oftentimes will really be the uh, serving in the way that a staff or senior staff in a larger congregation will. They're really the leaders of ministry the ones who are doing the work of the congregation. And they also have the job of governance, which is holding the congregation in behalf of its mission and holding it accountable to its mission. Unfortunately, when you have a group with that much practical day-to-day -day management responsibility, it has trouble finding time to be a governing board. And so typically it's the governance that doesn't happen. 
So with a board like that, it can be helpful to have an annual retreat where at least that one time you do your best to be a real governing board, or even sometimes to alternate parts of meetings or whole meetings to be devoted to one or another. In a pastoral-sized congregation, you have a new player in the mix. Call him the pastor. Uh, in a family-sized congregation, there may be a pastor, uh, but in fact that person is often not really part of the fellowship circle of the congregation at all. And if they are part of it, they often function more as a parent because they've been there a long, long time rather than as uh, an actual organizational leader by virtue of being the, 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 the identified pastor. In a pastoral-sized congregation, though, things have shifted because you have a, a group that's large enough that the, uh, there, there's only really one person that everybody has a relationship with. If you think about a group of 150 to 200 people or more, that is a group where they may say, we like this church because everybody knows everybody, but in fact, there are only a few people who are even known by everyone. Uh, and, and, and there might be one or two who actually literally know everyone, or there may not. And that shifts the dynamic of the congregation in an important way that has to do with joining. And this is where I think these size categories, the most important thing about them from the point of view of organizational decision making, is what is it that a person joins when they join this congregation? When a person joins a family-sized congregation, they're being accepted or adopted by the parents. If they join a pastoral-sized congregation, they do it by having a feeling about that pastor. If you go into a pastoral-sized congregation, you can identify them immediately by asking how things are going. And in that size congregation, people will not skip a beat before they tell you how they feel about the pastor. And I didn't say, you might have noticed this, that everybody likes the pastor. They all just have a feeling about that person. One of the rules of a pastoral or family-sized congregation is that everything has to be for everybody. Churches that size are very uncomfortable, as a rule, with groups that are exclusive to those who have made a commitment or are going to come to every session or whatever. Almost everything, everybody has to be invited, and in particular, uh, the important people in the congregation have to be present or their absence is noted from almost anything that happens. They are, in that sense, single-celled organizations because everybody in the congregation has one set of leaders that they're looking toward. The parents, the, the clergy leader. This changes when a congregation successfully moves from pastoral to multi-cell, what used to be called program. A lot of congregations think they're in the pastoral to program uh, transition, which actually happens, in my view, only at about 250 average attendance. So in fact, a lot of congregations that talk about pastoral to program transition are actually in transition from family to pastoral. The multi-celled organization is one in which people primarily join a subgroup rather than the congregation as a whole. This is a huge shift because it breaks that primary rule of smaller congregations that everything has to be for everybody and everybody has to belong to the whole congregation. It's almost a betrayal of the congregation for anyone to be more loyal or more connected to their subgroup than to the whole. Most choirs have somebody who knows exactly who the choir director is, knows where, what part they sing, but would be very fuzzy about such things as who the pastor is or what denomination the church belongs to. And the uh, multi-celled organization takes that breaking of rules and makes it the norm. In fact, to get to that size, to get to a regular worship attendance above 250, 
you have to have primary points of attention, uh, of connection, that are smaller than that 250 size group, because that's too large. That's more people than will be at anyone's memorial service unless they're a public figure of some kind, because it's larger than the number of actual personal relationships that a ordinary human being can have. Few exceptions exist. A professional size congregation uh, is yet another step. <clears throat> what people join in a professional size congregation is number one, they join a subgroup, which of course, incidentally, being a family size group, typically it'll have its own parents, it might have its own pastor type figure if you have a staff member who's in charge of a group of 150 or so. But a, the joining of the congregation has to do with the, the regard that people have for the consistent excellence that it produces. And uh, that's true not just of the professional size, but of the strategic and matrix size congregations as well. The, the primary job of the leadership group is to produce excellence on a consistent basis. And so I think you can see from this very brief overview that as you get larger, the priority of determining what excellence is and then producing it gets step by step by step more important, whereas the, uh, the personal human face-to-face -face relationships, while they continue to be important, they have less and less to do with the congregation as a whole and are taken care of instead in subgroups uh, that are smaller. 